My Redeemer is also a pilot. That's what I just heard from James. Thank you so much. Great, great story for kids and adults. Um, Horace, you and I were kind of nervous, concerned before the service because, again, we had problems with the Internet. No way to go live on time. We apologize and uh, sorry that we have to we have to be late. But guess what? There is always a way, and God is in charge. So thank you so much, Horace, for your support, your prayers, and uh, your leadership here in the Maribyrnong SDA Church. AV team, all of you are doing a fantastic job. Um, in spite of, in spite of, uh, you've been working hard, you've been going back and forth <laughs> trying to find out what the problem is, um, and um, I do thank you for everything you do. Happy Sabbath, and I'm glad you're joining us for this message. As a matter of fact, today we're finishing this series called Misconceptions. And today is a classic. People have trouble at work. People have trouble at home. Problems with their health, with their financial life. And we all know what that's like. And we know that usually when we're facing problems, someone who wants to encourage people will come along and say something like, Come on, you can face this. You're, str you're strong. You're tough. You're capable. Besides, we know this is not beyond your ability to cope. Because the Bible says, God never gives us more than we can handle. And the PowerPoint is not really working. Now, that's often intended to be a, a statement to give comfort. And it's also taken as a promise. Okay? Um, if you trust God, uh, people are trying to tell you things are going to be okay. If you trust God, people are trying to tell you your life will be manageable. The problem is that the Bible doesn't say that. You don't find that in the Bible. As a matter of fact, you don't find this in the Bible. God will never give you more than you can handle. Even though we hear that from time to time from Christians as well. In fact, if you've ever read the Bible, you'll find out that uh, the Bible is largely the story of people being given things they cannot handle. So let me put that phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle. Let me put that in perspective, okay? Let's talk to some people in the Bible. I'll start talking to Abel. I come to him, Old Testament, book of Genesis, and I tell Abel, I would not worry about your brother Cain. God never gives us more than we can handle. Oops, sorry, that's not true. But then I said, no, let me find someone else. Oh yeah, I know, I'll talk to Uriah, okay? And I said, Uriah, I wouldn't worry too much about King David. I wouldn't worry about much about King David or your wife or all of that stuff because God never, oh, oops, again. Big mistake. So I'll find someone else from the New Testament. And that'll be John the Baptist. And I say, hey, John the Baptist, I wouldn't worry about Herod and, 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 and that machete that he has because God... Oop, that's a big oops. If you really look at the Bible, starting 
with Jesus and going down the line, the Bible is mostly about people whose faith is in God, not only does not prevent their suffering, but very often actually causes their suffering. That's what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, I don't see anybody in the Bible trying to console one another by saying, God won't give you more than you can handle. Jesus himself, he ends his life being crucified. And his disciples take over the cause. And the first thing they, they have is they are arrested. And they are beaten. And this is what the Bible says. Let me see the PowerPoint. No, the PowerPoint is still not working. They say it is. Okay. Okay. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. If you remember, when Paul was called by Jesus, the very first thing that Jesus tells him is this. I must show Paul how much he will suffer for my name. I'll say something else. The people God uses seem to have remarkably little concern about how much suffering they have to do. Because somehow... They know that there is a cause worth suffering for and there is a Savior worth suffering with. And I'll say that to you and to me as well. We ought to have a cause worth suffering for and a Savior worth suffering with. Now the Bible has a verse that is kind of similar to what we just heard. God won't give you more than you can handle. And people usually refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. But there is a big difference. Let's see. Okay, here we have it. Nope. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Amen? Now, this is important here. Because if we understand this text, we know what the Bible's talking about. Okay? Paul's not saying, expect minimal suffering because God won't give you anything that you cannot bear. No, that's not what Paul's saying. No matter of what, what Paul's saying here, God will not allow temptation to come your way without providing a way out for you. That's what God's saying. Now, let's think about the city of Corinth, where Paul is writing. This is a port city. According to history... It was notorious for greed, for sexual promiscuity, idolatry, arrogance, selfishness. As a matter of fact, people who wanted to be tempted would go to Corinth. Okay? If they wanted really to pursue temptation, that was a place to go. It was like Temptation Island. All right? And it was kind of weird. Because it happens to and I as well. Once I want to be tempted, I can find all kinds of ways to rationalize doing what it is I want to do. And I can even drag God into it. I heard a story about this gambling addict. And he knew, of course, that he had a problem. But he was in denial. 
So one day he's talking to his wife on the phone. And he kind of uh, puts out a fleece, just like Gideon. And he says, honey, this is what I'm going to do. I'll drive around the casino. And if there is an open parking space right in front of the casino, I will know it is God's will for me to go and play a little bit. And sure enough, the guy went to the casino. And the seventh time around, there was an open space right in front. In our day, the word temptation has largely become a joke or a tease. You know, you hear the word temptation usually on dessert menus or reality TV shows. But temptation does terrible things. It's more serious than people think. It will try to unravel your humanity by convincing you that you are just an appetite that has to be gratified. And I'll tell you one thing right now. God does not do that. What God's saying here is, He will give you a way out. And He will give you a fellowship group. If you're an addict, He will give you a fellowship group. Not only that, He will give you the opportunity to confess and to come clean. He will give you someone who loves you to pray for you. you he will give you someone who loves you to be accountable to. to. So you got to be careful when you say, Ah, oh, I have no one else to count on. No, no, God's giving you all tools on all kinds of people so that you can find a way out. As a matter of fact, you've heard the word conscience before. And you've heard that the Holy Spirit works in your mind, trying to convince you. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is at work, and the Holy Spirit is working with you to tell you sometimes, run, don't walk out this You know, walk out of this situation. Or sometimes he's telling you, you know what? What you're doing this, not going to work. Go somewhere else. This is the wrong path. Do not take it. One of the reasons why fellowship is so important for our church is that we help each other live up to who God made us to be. And is that God will provide a way out. And the danger is when I settle in and when I really want something that I'm not looking for a way out anymore. And as a pastor, I want to pause here for a moment and I want to tell you, don't play with temptation. And there is all kinds of temptations. All right? Maybe it's a financial dishonesty. Maybe it's flirtation. Maybe it's pursuing sexual intimacy outside of marriage. Maybe it's a habit that is turning into an addiction or refusing to be generous with your money or your finances. Maybe it's a pattern of lying and deceit. It all starts small, but it's not small anymore. And I'll say to you and to the church, God is not mocked. And sin will corrode your soul, and, your, and sin will ruin your character, and sin will destroy your eternity if you let it. That's why Paul's saying here, but God is faithful. He will make a way out. You know, the most 
frequently cited Bible passage about today saying is really about temptation. But that still leaves a question. The question is, does God give people more than they can handle? And for that one, I find another passage, also written by Paul. But this is the second letter to the Corinthians. Okay? And this is what it says in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Amen? This is powerful. This is amazing. And I'll start by noticing that Paul calls God the Father of what? The Father of all compassion and the God of all comfort. One problem with that phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle, is that it kind of makes it sound like God is the one handling the suffering to you. I should say handing the suffering to you. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible is really clear. God hates evil. And God hates suffering. And God is not sitting up in heaven and saying, You know what? I'll just give this person an abusive father. Yeah. He or she deserves it. Uh Uh-uh. I don't see God doing that. I don't see God up in heaven saying, I'll give that person a case of terminal cancer just because. I don't see God doing that either. Or saying, I'll mess up this family by causing a car accident. Never. Paul is quite deliberate when he describes God. And he is not the father of evil and the God of all pain. According God is the Father of compassion and the God not just of comfort, but of all comfort. How about that? And then it's not just that. Not only does God comfort us in our suffering, He then, the Bible says, He uses us to be able to bring the comfort and healing and hope we receive to other people. Believe it or not, the very scars and wounds that we carry around, those that are often most hidden, and we just don't want to let people know, those, ironically, in the gospel and in the power of the cross, become the stories we tell people. They become the bridges we build that enable us to be part of a healing and hope and comfort to other people who are suffering as well. In fact, people who are willing to share their experiences, their suffering, they together experience both a healing and a kind of community that does not happen with people who only share success and triumph. Because these people once thought, I'm alone, but now they find out, I'm not alone no more. I'm not the only one. If you have ever suffered, and there is all kinds of suffering, I'll just mention a few. I'll mention more than a few. If you have ever suffered from deep grief, or loss, loneliness. If you or somebody you love has ever been in trouble by addiction, or alcohol, or substance abuse, or sex, or gambling, 
If you've ever been through the pain of betrayal and, and, and divorce and, and, and broken family, if, if, you've, if you've experienced the pain of not having your spouse with you or your child with you anymore, if you've lost a loved one, if you've ever had a miscarriage, if you've ever had the ache of wanting to have a child but not being able to have it, then you know what it is. If you've ever had vocational pain or failure or being terminated or you have no job right now, if you've been through cancer or heart problems or any health conditions, now if you've ever felt failure as a parent, if you've ever felt that you are not good at what you're doing, if you're the victim of emotional or physical or sexual abuse or assault, these are all realities. These are all things that we go through in life. And if you have not gone through all of them, and I hope you have not, you've gone through one or two. And I'll tell you what, if you have ever known any of those conditions or in some other way you have experienced suffering. God is trying to tell us something today. God is saying, everybody, I'll say again, everybody fights a battle. Only they and God know. Don't feel like you're the only one. Because you're not. You're not alone. As a matter of fact, I would say the church, the Melbourne Seventh-day Adventist Church, should be a fellowship of the troubled heart. Should be a place in which we walk together, and Paul promises that God will walk with us. And that's a good part of it. You see? We often look at each other. And when we look at each other, this is what happens. We think that he or she is so smart. He or she is so successful. He or she is not having the problems that I do. But we don't even know. And we don't see what God says. The church. The church is not a place where people come because everything is okay. The church is not a place where people come because everybody's doing fine. I'll say one more time. The church is the fellowship of the troubled heart. That's who we are. That's what the church is all about. That's what the church has ever been. And the church is the place you go when you are not handling it. Here's a strange truth. And this is a truth that happens in church. In the cruciform life. That is the cross center and the cross shape life. If you have suffered. If you have gone through a lot. If you have learned anything from that. If you have suffered major hurt. You have a major gift to offer. What? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'll say that again. If you have suffered a major hurt, you have a major gift to offer. I say you have a major contribution to make others feel better. Because it's not because of your strength, but it's because of what is happening with your life once you've turned it to Jesus. So your scar, your limp, your wound, your inadequacy, anything that has happened to you will be turned around and somehow it will become a blessing to others. For reasons I do not understand, share pain creates a community. Shared pain creates a community that untroubled triumph does not create. Now, this does not mean that your suffering is always manageable. No. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that your suffering is always manageable. 
But what I'm saying is that your suffering is always meaningful. Do you get that? I want you to look at how Paul described his troubles. Okay? And we're going to read for, from 2 Corinthians. Again, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. That's what he says. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We are under great pressure. Listen to this. We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Okay? So that we despair of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. On a scale from 1 to 10, how much trouble is that? I would say very close to 10. Really bad troubles, really bad problems in our life will be the maximum we could endure. That's what we think. And of course, if God never gave us any more than we can handle, then that would be the limit, the maximum we can handle. All right? The maximum we can endure. But Paul says here, that's not the limit. No. He says that his troubles were not just what he could endure. They were not even all that we could, he could endure. They were beyond all he could endure. Not just a moderate amount beyond, but they were far beyond. He could endure. In fact, according to the Bible, Paul was in the despair zone. He had received a death sentence. But this happened, he says, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. This happens that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who what? Raises the dead. The question is not what I can handle. The question should be what? Okay. The question is what God and I can handle. Someone put it like this. Let me try the PowerPoint again because it's not working. Um, okay, someone put it like this. It's not that God won't give you any more than you can handle, but that God will help you handle wherever you've been given. I like that. Since it's not up there, I'll say it again. It's not that God won't give you any more than you can handle, but that God will help you handle whatever you've been given. You know, when I hear that phrase, God will not give you more than you can handle, I often think, that's not true. Of course God will. People die. As far as I know, dying is what you do when your body cannot handle it anymore. And people die every single day. And if you rely on yourself when it comes to death, death will probably win. That's why Paul says, God will give us a what? Way out. And Paul throws in an afterthought. Okay, he said, so that we would rely on God who raises the dead. Now, if you know 
and love somebody who has died. If you know someone that is dying, here is the good news. Bible says God will comfort us in our trouble. He will bring comfort because God is the one who raises the dead. He's got the power to give life again. He's got the power to do whatever he wants to. And he's telling us, I will comfort you when you have trouble. He's the God of the universe. And in his care, in his death, and in his resurrection, he says, I will destroy everything and anything to give you comfort. How does God comfort us? I'll just mention a few little things. I'll say, first of all, He comforts us in prayer. In prayer. And we've talked about that before. But not only in prayer, but He also comforts us through the words of Scripture. By the way, if you're a Christian, when was the last time you took some precious minutes of your day and spent time with God reading the Scripture? When was the last time that somehow you said, Lord, there is so many beautiful things here. Some of them I don't quite understand. But spending time with you in Scripture gives me so much comfort. If you haven't done that, let me tell you this. You're missing the world. Prayer, words of the scripture. And I'll mention something else. A hymn. A worship song. Do you like singing? If you don't like singing because you don't have the voice of uh, Roxanne, I'm pretty sure you, you love listening to, to people like, like her. You know, they have such a pretty voice. And, and, and every, time, every time I hear special music like the one we just heard, ah. I rejoice. I am so happy. I am blessed. So singing, it's another way in which God comforts us all. You know, I think about sometimes, and it's happened to me twice already. I go to a hospital, and I go visit someone that happens to be almost dying, a person that is very, very sick, a person that, that can hardly talk at all. And when I get close to the bed, that person is whispering, It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. You know, through our thoughts, God can also bring comfort. Because He can whisper to us. He can remind us things that we've studied. And we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I will not fear evil because you are with me. Through our thoughts, God will bring comfort. That's the reality of Jesus in my mind. I remember one of my elders in a church back in California, Santa Maria Valley Church. My wife and I pastored there for several years. I will mention the name of this elder. But um, he was one of those people that you meet 
and immediately you, you become friends with. He was humble, but he was wise at the same time, and he was well respected for keeping the balance. One day I received a call. Back in the days, there was no cell phones. Do you remember landline uh, telephones? Do you? Okay. <laughs> Some of us do. Um, but I remember I received a call. And it was this brother of mine, elder from the church. And he said, Pastor, I'd like to ask you to pray for me. I said, Sure. And you have to understand what was going on. You see, he was diabetic. He was diabetic. And um, after the last visit with the doctor, the test results were not too good. As a matter of fact, were not good at all. He had just received a call from the doctor, and the doctor said that the best course of action at this point was to amputate a couple of toes from his right foot. And we prayed. And the next day, my wife and I went to visit him and his wife. And the day before the surgery, we were together, the four of us, praying together again. And after the surgery, the doctor said that it was worse than he thought. And a few months later, I received another call from my brother, elder from this church, and he asked me to pray again because the doctor had just told him that his foot needed to be amputated. Not only my wife and I are praying for this elder, but the whole church was praying for him. We were united in prayer. A few months passed by, and I received another call. This time, the doctor is recommending amputating the leg up to his knee. And you know what? I did not tell him, God will not give you more than you can handle. I couldn't. There was no way I would do such a thing. We talked, we worried, we wondered, we hoped, and we prayed. That's all we did. But that's not the end of the story. A little bit less than a year later, he calls me back again and tells me that he's having yet another surgery. And this time, is the foot of the other leg. And I remember him telling me, not again. Not again. He had tears in his eye. And he said, Pastor, I don't think I'll be able to handle it anymore. See, in the fellowship of shared suffering, people don't say to one another, God won't give you more than you can handle. People don't say such a thing. People don't say everything happens for a reason or it's going to be okay. It's going to be better. I promise you. You don't say that. You can't promise anything. You're not God. But all we can say is God will help you handle whatever you're going through. And we pray. We pray for one another. Honestly, I don't know why this happens. Parents who lost, lost a child. Cancer survivors. Addicts whose life just got crushed. People who have been hurt 
by the church. People without a job, people without a home, people going through rejection and divorce. You cannot handle it by yourself. But hear me now. God and you can definitely handle it together. Because we are the fellowship of the troubled heart. And because we gather under the shadow of the cross where the crucified God says, I am here with you and I am here for you no matter what. I like to ask God to bring comfort to every hurting heart who's listening to us right now. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, thank you for being our merciful, gracious God. I ask, Lord, that you bless everybody who hurts. I ask you, Lord, to be in a special way with everybody who grieves, everybody who is in fear, everybody who's going through a struggle that they cannot handle themselves. I ask you, Lord, to be with them and to remind them. You cannot do it by yourself, but we can do it together. I am with you. Lord, remind us that you are the Almighty One. Remind us that you went through the cross, suffering and pain for us. And now you offer comfort that no one else can give us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.